Well, we are beginning a new uh, series tonight called Living for the Weekend, and uh, I'm really excited about it. And uh, it was one of those moments uh, where I was praying and talking to Jen, okay, what's this next series? We have like, you know, five, six weeks before Easter comes. And I really just was overcome with this idea that Jesus lived his entire life for this one weekend. It was his whole life directed towards his death and resurrection. And we have that proven throughout Scripture again and again. He says, this is why I came. And how because he lived for this weekend of his death and resurrection, we get to live from that weekend. We get to live from a place of being saved because of his sacrifice. We get to live from a place of victory that he gave us when he raised from the dead. And how when we begin to realize what, what does that look like? It changes everything. And so what we're going to be doing over the next six weeks is we're going to be looking at the last week of Jesus' life before his death and resurrection and how the conversations he had, the miracles that he did, the, the actions that, that he put forth were all meaningful, right? You, when you know this is your last week before the crescendo of your life, you know that you don't waste a moment. You don't waste a word. There is more written about the last week of Jesus' life before his death than any other event or season of his life in all the Gospels. Most of the gospel writers direct most of their book to this last week of his life. So we're going to be looking not at everything, but it's a few things that happen and how we can get tied up into uh, what do we get to understand about the purpose of God. Uh, so just by a raise of hands, just, just a few of you, how many of you guys uh, are planners, right? Like you love, plan- wow, a lot of you guys. Anyone like not? Like you're like, dude, I like spontaneity. Like I just want to, I'm a free spirit. <laughs> so true. Um, you're, you're just these people and it, I'm married to one of those. But as much as I like to think of myself as a creative and artist, I love planning. I love that I want to get the most out of life. And the way I can do that is to ev- cram as much life as I can into every single box that I've set up for. And a lot of times it gets me into trouble, and so this happened to me um, yesterday uh, because we have a really, really busy weekend. We normally do right now. I'm working a couple different jobs. And so this morning we led worship at a church in Carlsbad called Daybreak. And yesterday uh, my kids were at a play. I had a lunch meeting. We had f- uh, friends over for dinner. And so Jen looked at me. She's like, when are we going to practice music? And I'm just like, have this check. And I'm like, oh, I didn't think about that. And I look at my calendar. I'm trying to clean up the house. And I'm like, I have an hour between 10 and 11 that we can practice music. And like, in my mind, like, it's locked and loaded. I don't know about anybody else, but like, nothing will touch that hour. Like, because, and, and it's how it gives me like peace. Like, I'm like, otherwise I feel overwhelmed. But if I know I'm going to get it done, I don't know about you, but like, I just feel better about myself. I'm like, okay, well, we're going to practice from 10 to 11. And she doesn't really care, but for me, it mattered a lot. And so 10 o'clock rolls around. I literally finished my last thing. I walk to go tell Jen. I'm like, hey, let's go practice music. Let's, you know, check that box. And she's like, hey, honey, I, they just broke a light bulb in Jubilee's room. And I'm just like, ah, like, man, like, you know, this is going to at least throw me off 15 minutes. And that's totally going to ruin, like, how much time we could have planned for this thing. And I'm, I'm, I'm thinking this. I'm not saying this out loud, of course. I'm not an idiot. So I'm thinking. I'm kind of frustrated. I walk in. I'm like, why do kids break things, you know? Um, and, and I walk into a room. And I kid you not, this, this light bulb didn't break. It exploded. Like, I, like I've, in my entire life, I've never seen a bigger explosion of glass ever. Like, I kid, I'm not exaggerating. There's a glass on top of bookshelves in closets on my kid's bed, like in tiny little pieces of this fragile little light bulb. So it's a really, it's in my daughter's hair. It's everywhere. And I begin to assess the situation. I'm like, this is going to take me a long time. There goes my hour. And sure enough, it took me an hour to clean my daughter's room. I had to vacuum every single square inch of the entire thing because it was it was everywhere. I don't want to do So I walk into the kitchen, and I'm just fuming, right? I'm not saying anything because I'm trying to, like, keep it together. But I'm like, there, I'm like, great, now I can't practice, and that's going to put more stress on my wife. And I wish I would have thought about this before. And I walk into the kitchen, and Jen just sees that I'm having this bad attitude. And she just, just very gently, just very kind of, like, spirit, like, Holy Spirit-like just looks at me. She's like, aren't you glad that your daughters aren't going to step in glass? And I was like... 
yeah, of course I am. But in that moment, I had this massive revelation that my plan had clouded my vision for my greater purpose as a dad. And, and I say that as, a, as an illustration to, because that's exactly what happened to the disciples right before Jesus enters into Jerusalem, right before he has his last week, is all of them have this plan, all of them have this agenda that has been leading up to this moment where they have been waiting for the Messiah to come in all of his glory. I mean, there's hundreds of prophecies about this day, and it's coming, right? And so they have all of these ideas and these plans of this is what it's going to be like so much so concerned with the plan of how it would be play out that they completely lost track of the purpose of why that weekend was coming in the first place. They lost sight of it. And that's really where the story begins, begins tonight is how the disciples have this really big moment where they just miss it. So if you, if you have a Bible, turn to Mark chapter 10. This is where we're going to be tonight. Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32, says this. They were on their way up to Jerusalem. When Jesus leading the way, and the disciples were astonished, or those who follows, followed were afraid. Okay, so this is what's happening, right? So they're leading up to Jerusalem, and it's like West Side Story, right? They're like snapping. Like, it's about to go down. Now, if you're new to church, you know, the reason why this is such a big deal is because the, it, the Jewish people have been under different sort of oppressive regimes for about seven to 800 years. And all along, there's been these prophecies that someday there would be this promised one, translated Messiah, that would come and would overthrow this government, and his government would never end, Right? And so all for centuries, there's been these whispers of some days it's going to come. And then this obscure rabbi shows up and everyone starts being like, maybe this is him. And it's Passover. It's the, it's the, it's the festival where this is going to happen. And he starts marching towards Jerusalem where before he's kind of stayed away. And everyone starts to whisper like, this is the moment. Here he comes. He's entering into Jerusalem. This is what we've been waiting for. This is what our ancestors have been waiting for. And I don't know if you've ever seen or witnessed a junior high or high school fight. But sometimes the anticipation of the fight is more interesting than the actual fight. So, so true story, I was in junior high, and I, and I tackled this guy, Connor McDaniel. Um, uh, not Connor McDaniel, that's another guy, no. This guy named Connor, let's just call him Connor. In football, and I, and I totally tweaked his neck, right? And so this guy gets super mad, he looks at me, and he's like, we're going to fight tomorrow behind the wall ball court. I'm like, bring it on, bro. I'm in like sixth grade. And we walk away, and I'm like, what have I done? And so I have this 24 hours before I'm about to meet this guy behind the wall ball court, and it's about to go UFC, right? Like, and so the entire 24 hours was amazing. By the way, I totally beat him. But um, that's not the point. The, the build up to that moment was more agonizing than any punch that I took. It was like this, like, oh, what's going to happen? This is kind of the opening verse that we see right here, is that everyone is kind of locked into this moment. They're following him. They're astonished, and they're afraid. So again, he took the 12 aside and told them what was going to happen to him. This is what Jesus said. We're going to Jerusalem, he said, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will be hand, and hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Now, the reason why this is such a big deal is this is the third time in Mark's gospel that Jesus is recorded saying the exact same thing. And in Jewish literature, when you repeat yourself two times, it's as if you're screaming it. But if you repeat yourself three times, this is why when God says he's holy, 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 he's really just trying to get your attention. Like, he's holy. So when Jesus repeats this three times, this is his third time, he's trying to get his disciples' atten attention. It's pretty clear. I'm going to Jerusalem. I will be handed over to the chief priest. I will be flogged, spit upon, beaten, and I will be killed, and I will be raised on the third day. So you think at this point they would, like, totally get it. Like, okay, maybe this whole plan of the Messiah might look a little bit different than the one that I thought. But this is not what happens. His disciples are so blind to what they were anticipating this Messiah to do that they completely miss it. Listen to what happens in verse 35. 
And so this is, but he just tells them, I'm about to die and be raised again. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him. Teacher, they said, listen to their response. We want you to do for us whatever we ask. It's like Jesus is like a genie or something like that. And I love how merciful Jesus is. What do you want me to do for you, he asked. And this is where they just, this is where it just gets the most frustrating. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptized with the baptism I baptize with? They looked at each other, I'm assuming, like, kind of like, and they're like, we can, (laughs) they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptized with the baptism I am baptized with. But to sit at my right hand or left hand is not for me to grant. These places belong to those whom they have been prepared. When the ten heard about this, they became indignant with James and John, probably frustrated because they're like, we should have thought about that. We should have been like, hey, put us on your right or your left. We want to have authority and majesty. We want to be the guys in this new kingdom you're about to bring into Jerusalem. We know what's coming. We want to be your right and your left. Jesus called them together and said, you know that those who are regarded as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them. And their high officials exercising authority over them, not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be a slave to all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Guys, this would have been a radical shock to their system. Because they're expecting authority and dominion and power and an overthrow of the Roman Empire. And instead, what Jesus says is, if you want to be great, you become a servant. Servant? I thought we were supposed to be warriors. I thought this was our moment. And Jesus says, no, no, no. If you want to be the greatest, you must become the servant of all. This is my kingdom strategy. And then what happens is Mark's last recorded miracle happens. So he just just has this big, like, disciples are just super arrogant, totally missing it, right? They have the plan above the purpose. And then something happens that would have just really made them, like, even more upset. It says, and then they came to Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples together with a large crowd were leaving the city, right? They're going to Jerusalem. A blind man, Bartimaeus, which means son of Timaeus, was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called to the blind man, cheer up. On your feet, he's calling you. You just, you just hear like the, the arrogance, right, in the disciples' feet. Like, we're the right and the left. And here's this guy we've been trying to shut up for the past five minutes. And he won't stop calling for Jesus. And Jesus now stops the whole crowd and just says, call him over to me. So they go and say, cheer up, on your feet, he's calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, that's important, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Did you notice Jesus asked him the exact same question he asked his disciples? What do you want me to do for you? One demanded majesty and one requested mercy. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the roadside. I mean, come on. You cannot have two more contrasting stories, right? One story, you have the insiders, the disciples, and they come and they totally miss it. They totally miss the purpose of the, of the coming kingdom. And they're asking for majesty. They're asking to the right and the left. And Jesus, it kind of entertains them and says, what do you want from me? And he says, 
you know what? You, yeah, you are going to drink that cup. You are going to experience death. But I can't promise you that. But I will promise you this. If you serve people, you'll be great. That's the insiders. But then there's this absolute outsider named Bartimaeus. And we, what's fascinating is as Peter is recording this through Mark's handwriting, he remembers him probably because Bartimaeus became a significant figure in the church, so much so that he knew his name and his father's name. And so his audience would have been like, oh, yeah, we know. Oh, Bart, we love Bart. Yeah, Bartimaeus is the man. And this is how Bartimaeus enters the story. He's the outsider. He's the blind beggar on the outskirts of Jericho, this kind of, this kind of ragtag community outside of Jerusalem. And here he sits every day because he's blind, and he has no ability to make income other than just to beg. And he hears that this, this, this rabbi, Jesus of Nazareth, is coming, and he calls out, Son of David, which, by the way, was Messiah, coming king, son of David, the, the kingdom that will never end. Have mercy on me. That's all he can do is just cry out, and the crowds are just trying to, shh, he's about to go to Jerusalem. You don't get it. He's about to enter into the very moment where his kingdom comes. But he calls again, son of David, have mercy on me. And I love it that Jesus, consumed with the last moments of his life, would find it in his purpose to stop everything and just look at this man and ask him the same question he asked the insiders and he asked this outsider what do you want from me you can just imagine that this, I just imagine Bartimaeus in that moment being like I can't believe I'm talking to Jesus of Nazareth and in humility not arrogance he would just say I want to see and Jesus says, go. Your faith has healed you. That word healed is this Greek word sozo, and it means wholeness or saved. Your faith has saved you or your faith has made you whole. But this is what's fascinating about Bartimaeus' response. He just gets healed like that, and he doesn't go and find his family. We know his dad's still around. He doesn't go and go find a great view of the city. You know what he does? He leaves everything, and he starts following Jesus. He gets it. He, he understands that what is happening here is even bigger than regaining his eyesight, and there's these contrasting stories that Mark is trying to tell to illustrate this is the kind of kingdom that's coming. And so here it is, if you're taking notes. This kingdom that is coming that Jesus is bringing into Jerusalem, that he's bringing forth through the cross and his resurrection, the strategy of that kingdom is always servanthood. And he cannot get around it. It's servanthood. But the mission of that kingdom is always wholeness. For blind Bartimaeus, who was not supposed to be part of the story, according to the disciples. He's, kind of, he's the bystander, the outsider, the blind beggar. There's tons of them. In Matthew's gospel, it actually records there's two blind men God saved, but this guy is given a name in Mark's gospel. For him, there's this moment that Jesus says, the kingdom I'm bringing for the masses is available to you right now. It's wholeness, it's sozo, it's this, this salvation, this all-encompassing healing that he brings. So let's talk about these two things real quick. The call to serve and the call to wholeness. The, the, the strategy of serving and the mission of wholeness that God is bringing forth in this moment. The first is the call to serve. I think it's so funny how, how Christians, we, we try and turn serving into a volunteer position in children's ministry or we turn serving uh, into something that you, you do as community service rather than this consuming lifestyle that you live for the betterment of others. I love that Simon Sinek is this, this leadership guru, right? He has one of the most watched TED Talk videos and, and is this brilliant thinker of our age. And he wrote this book called Leaders Eat Last. And I remember the first time I picked up his book, and I'm just like, this guy totally stole Jesus' strategy. Leaders eat last? Are you kidding me? This is Jesus' like, whole strategy for his kingdom, and this guy's making millions of dollars. And everyone's like, this is so insightful. And Jesus is like, duh. 
This stuff really works. You want to change the world. It happens when you get on your hands and your knees and you wash dirt off people's feet. This is what Simon Sinek says in his book, Leaders Eat Last. And I don't believe Simon's a Christian as far as I don't know. But listen to the insight that he has that he didn't make up, but Jesus was talking about thousands of years before. He says this, Leaders are the ones who run headfirst into the unknown. They rush toward the danger. They put their own interests aside to protect us or to pull us into the future. Leaders would sooner sacrifice what is theirs to save what is ours, and they would never sacrifice what is ours to save what is theirs. This is what it means to be a leader. It means they choose to go first into danger, head first toward the unknown. And when we feel sure they will keep us safe, we will march behind them and walk tirelessly to see their visions come to life and proudly call ourselves their followers. I love this. I love this, like, raw, unedited. It doesn't take a theologian to talk about the significance that happens when we choose to live a life of serving. And I don't know about you, but serving can, serving can sound, surfing too, serving can sound romantic, but man, it's not. Serving is not glamorous. I remember when I first got married, and I thought I was a really good guy, and then I got married. And one of the reasons... <laughs> One of the reasons I realized I was skewed in my vision is we're married and I, would, and I would do the dishes or I would do these different things and I would be serving our, my wife, right? I'd be serving our marriage. And immediately after I was done, I would be observing to see if she would serve me back. And I remember the Holy Spirit very early on just like tapping me on the shoulder and he's like, what are you doing? <laughs> That's not serving, <laughs> That's self-serving. You're trying to get something in return rather than just giving and serving and loving. And to this day, I fight this selfishness that can be wrapped up in serving. Sometimes some of us serve just because it makes us feel good. And by the way, that's not the kind of serving Jesus is talking about. Yes, it's meaningful, but it's never supposed to be a self-fulfilling act, but a selfless one. So here's, here's some homework for you guys because we don't have time to do this tonight. Um... But I'm going to talk about three things that can, we can meditate on, three scriptures that we can meditate on when it comes to serving, um, so that in your own time, kind of you guys can be looking through these things and, and understanding, am I serving in the way that Christ talks about? So here's three things, and I don't think it's going to come, oh, there it is. Number one, serving looks like embracing humility. No one embraced humility more than Jesus. You cannot be enthroned in heaven on earth and be born into a feeding trough, you can't beat that. You can't be the creator of the universe and then be rubbing some of that universe off dirty feet. You can't beat that. So read Philippians 2 and just begin to evaluate, how am I doing embracing humility in my life? Number two, increase in love. If, you, if there's areas in your life, if you ever want to just let the Lord just make you feel like there's a lot of work to do, just read 1 Corinthians 13. And just let it work on your heart. This isn't a guilt thing. This is a, Lord, I'm being called into a deeper way of living. This call to serve. And lastly, the most effective you will ever be serving is when you yourself are able to receive Jesus serving you. This is hard. One of the most provocative verses in the Bible is when, in Psalm 23, when David writes, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And when he writes that, do you know what he's saying? Yahweh, the creator of the universe, is serving him at a table. I mean, that's why that, that passage is so powerful. It's why Peter, when he's washing his feet, says, you can't do this. It's so hard to let the God of the universe actually give something to you because it's so backwards. He's king. But can I tell you, when you receive service from the king of kings, you can serve others because all we are are dust. And when we can't serve others, we have a very misconstrued conception of how worthy we are. But when we let Jesus serve us, it fuels us to serve others. Number two, we talked about this call to service. It's called to wholeness. And just three things on this call to wholeness and how to cultivate that in our, our lives, how to allow Jesus to, to come and touch these broken spaces, these unseen spaces in, in our heart. We can put these three things up. 
on the screen. We're just going to talk through these real fast. I really want to focus on, on the second one. Number one is you ha- all wholeness begins with a cry for mercy. It's not like, I'm going to go change myself, you know? I just read a good book, heard a good podcast, heard a good sermon. I'm ready to go and make some changes. New me, right? New year? New you? Let's go. It, it, that's not what wholeness looks like. Wholeness begins when you cry for something that you cannot manufacture yourself. It's what, it's what Bartimaeus was doing. I can't give myself sight. I love what Billy Graham, who passed away this week, one of the, probably the greatest evangelist that has ever lived, says this. The wonderful news is that our Lord is a God of mercy, and he responds to repentance. How amazing that when we call out for mercy, he responds. Second thing is this. Stepping into wholeness means that you have to leave your cloak. Now, remember I told you to focus in on that line that Jesus, the disciples go and say, hey, Jesus is calling you. And the, the thing that Peter re- remembers, his, his eyewitness account that Mark is recording for him is, I remember blind Bartimaeus literally taking his cloak and throwing it and coming to Jesus. Now, this might, that just might seem like a minor detail to you, but that cloak is significant for three incredibly big reasons that you would have known if we lived in the ancient Near East. Number one, that was not just his coat. That was his blanket. That's his source of warmth and comfort. That is his, his only sense of kind of like when it's cold nights, like we just had a few nights ago. By the way, their climate's very similar. It's not always nice. Sick. You can imagine those nights get freezing. That was his source of warmth. And so when Jesus calls him forward, and he's blind, he can't go find it. He just tosses that that comfort away from him. The second thing is his cloak was also the source of his provision. So what would happen in those days is you would sit down on your cloak, and you'd have it around you. And as Jewish people would walk by, they had this thing called almsgiving. It was beyond the tithe. It was whenever you see a homeless person or someone who's blind or lame, you would go and you'd put money on their coat or their cloak, and that's how they would make money. So as he tosses his cloak, Peter's observing him throwing away any sort of strategy he has for provision. And then the third thing is, in that day, the robe you wore was was the authority and identity that you had. And whatever authority and identity Bartimaeus had, it was on that cloak. And so when he throws that, there goes that out the window as well. I mean, this guy is throwing away his comfort, his provision, and his identity because Jesus has something better than all three of those. He's literally like, Son of David, have mercy on me. You are everything I need. This cloak is a poor manufactured substitute for something deeper my soul is longing for. And everyone has a cloak, don't we? Every one of us has things that give us comfort that, that, are, that are horrible substitutions for what Jesus can bring. Every one of us has a cloak. Every one of us has these sources of provision, whether that's financial, whether that's relational, whether that's uh, egotistical, these things that provide this sense of worth for us that are just not Jesus. And every one of us have these things that identify us, these robes, these cloaks that we wear that say, well, I'm this person, I'm this type of girl, I'm this type of guy, and this is what makes me me. And it's not until we throw our cloak away and run to Jesus that we will ever experience the wholeness that he's promising us. This is where transformation happens. I mean, and sometimes, you guys, these, these, these cloaks... They're horrible substitutes where Jesus can bring, but they, they become so comfortable in our lives. Right now, Zoe, my, my precious nine-year-old, she's really compassionate. She cares a lot about people, but she also, if she ever gets hurt, that girl milks it, okay? Like, don't tell her I said that. She's starting to, like, listen. She's just found out there's a podcast. She's like, I want to listen to all your sermons, Dad. I'm like, oh, man, there goes all my stories about you. Um, Zoe, if you're listening, turn it off. Um, anyways. <laughs> But there, it's so funny. She literally has a knee brace on hand in her room for whenever her knee gets hurt. She has like an ankle brace. She's like, she's collecting these things. And I'm like, what are you doing? And it's so funny when she gets hurt. And then everyone's just like, oh my gosh, Zoe, what happened to you? I'm just like, please, come on. She's fine. She was just dancing two minutes ago. But the minute someone comes along, she's just like, oh my 
my knee, it just hurts so bad. By the way, I think she got that from me. But anyways, um, my mom's laughing right now. <laughs> this is so true. But I just look at her and I'm just like, you like, you like this poor fake veneer that gives you the kind of attention and maybe even false comfort that your soul is actually craving for. We all have them. We all have those things that just kind of just look for people and say, hey, can you look at me? Can you? And some of them are legit, some of them are not. But the idea is that Jesus tonight is offering a wholeness that is so much deeper that it fulfills every single thing in our hearts. And lastly, is follow the healer. True healing doesn't, doesn't just mean leaving brokenness, but following wholeness. This is not a message for you just to walk away from your brokenness. No, no, no. This is, that is not possible unless you follow wholeness. You know what I love? Is that Bartimaeus throws his cloak away before Jesus heals him. That's faith. And once he's healed, he doesn't go and start his own agenda. He follows Jesus' agenda. He's like, you're it for me now. I'm fully yours. And he gives his life to this person who just gave him not just sight, but sozo, wholeness. And that's what Jesus has to offer tonight. So would you close your eyes with me? And as you close your eyes, the, the chances are these two very different stories, the arrogant, the, dis, the arrogant disciples and the, and the mercy crying out for by blind Barnabas, the chances are we're in one of these two stories, or maybe both in some way. But, this, but it looks like this. If you are a Christ follower, you love Jesus, not, you don't just go to church, you love Jesus, Maybe tonight God is calling you back to a place of his purpose, not just his plan. His purpose to serve and love others in a way that looked just like he did to us. And maybe, maybe you're blind Bartimaeus. Maybe you are on the fringe and the outskirts of your life and you feel blind and lost. And tonight, Jesus and his Holy Spirit are right here just to say, hey, what do you want from me? And I'm convinced that he wants to meet you in your brokenness. He wants to meet you wherever you are. And to not provide just a superficial need, but a deep, soul-satisfying need that could only come through him. So I'm just going to go ahead and pray right now. And wherever you are, would we just have a moment where we just repent? Remember, we just talked about that God is merciful to those who repent. And whether that's us turning to humility and servanthood or whether that's just calling out and saying, Jesus, would you save me? Let's just pray. Father, we just thank you for tonight. Jesus, we thank you that you were not blinded by the hype of the crowds or by the plan that they set before you, but Lord, you were anchored to your purpose to serve others, to bring wholeness to broken people. And would we do the same? Lord, I pray for those who are in this room who feel themselves broken and blind, and lost, Lord, and I pray that tonight would be a night of salvation, of wholeness for them, and it would begin simply by just crying out for mercy. With everyone's eyes closed, if that's you, and tonight you're just calling out for mercy, you're just longing for Jesus just to touch you, and maybe you've never done that before, with everyone closing their eyes, you can even keep your eyes closed, would you just lift up your hand so I can pray for you? Right on. Right on. Thank you so much. Thank you guys for your honesty. Father, thank you so much for the hands that were raised in this room tonight. Lord, I'm asking that their request that was signaled by their hand, Lord, that you would just meet in abundance. Your mercy, your wholeness would just come upon them. That they would stop striving, but just receive the love that you have for them, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen.